We are blessed with beautiful children in this church, are we not? I say that um, because we come to Proverbs chapter 4. And I want to begin this morning with you imagining something. Maybe for many of us we can look back in our life at this moment, but some of us maybe remember our friends, our family members who experienced this. But I want you to imagine for a moment a father's love when his child comes into the world. And as a child comes in tender and precious, the child is precious to the mother who has labored in love to see life born into the world. The joy and the pleasure that is found in the parents with this child. In this imagining, I want you to picture still the, the infant becoming a toddler and, and the toddler becomes a child. And, and then as the child grows to a youth and then one day we awake and the child has become full adulthood. It's almost as if we blink our eyes, amen? All along the way as the child begins to speak, as the child learns to walk and then to run, and as the child begins to acquire the ability to coordinate his hands with the eyes and the feet, uh, the child begins to acquire the ability to, to know things and see things that previously they did not know or understand. Uh, imagine along the way the father's instruction and the mother's tender and precious love toward the child. Now if you can grasp that picture in your mind this morning, this is the imagined moment of Proverbs chapter 4, and specifically verses 1 through 9. This is the experience of Solomon with his wife toward Rehoboam, his son. This was David and Bathsheba toward Solomon. This was Jesse towards David and all the way back to when God, through his spirit, breathed life into mankind. This is that tender and that precious moment. And as we come to Proverbs chapter 4, we see that Solomon continues to teach his son. We might gather sometimes by reading the Bible that this was one long session of the father to the son, one of those big long conversations that took hours since we have been seeing the same language from Proverbs chapter 1 and the repetition to the, the value of obtaining wisdom. But church, I want you to see, it is not one long session with Solomon to his son, but rather it is Solomon and his son with the mother traveling life together. I, I want you to see the love poured out in the diligent teaching and the talking to the child when sitting in the house, when walking along the way, and even as the family lies down at night and then rises early the next morning to face a new day, these words of Solomon are the instruction that came from the command of Deuteronomy chapter 6 that a father and a mother has. They are the repeated and needful teaching of our children in today's world. It always has been. And it's the teaching of wisdom. Now this morning I want to take the first nine verses of chapter 4. And I want you to see the literal teaching of Solomon to Rehoboam, his son. And even more than this, church, I want us to see the greater, higher son that is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, at whose, knee, at whose name every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We want to see Jesus in this text. We, we have, have been reading, we've heard repeatedly, and we have learned that Jesus Christ is the power and the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 24. And so we want to take the scripture this morning, see the literalness, see the spiritual truth, and then most importantly, we want to apply it to our heart and to our life. Solomon says in the first two verses, he says, Listen, sons, to a father's discipline. And pay attention so that you may gain understanding, for I am giving you good instruction. Don't abandon my teaching. I don't know if I've said this in the last several weeks uh, since we started Proverbs chapter 1, but, but I want to give an encouragement to the parents, and I want to give uh, truth to parents. The encouragement is if we teach the word of God, we will have peace with our children. 
But the, the truth in the matter is that each child must choose the path that they will take. There have been good and godly parents that have raised a child with the word of God, but the child has still went off into their own way to a path of wickedness. We have a tendency in our culture, much like the Pharisees in the New Testament, and much like Job's friends in the book of Job, that want to blame another person for the result or a condition that is out there. No, each of, it, each of us are individually accountable to what we believe, what we live, and what we walk. But parents, never, never take yourself from the responsibility to teach your children the instruction that we find in the Word of God. Never delegate that to the pastor. Never give that to your Sunday school teacher. Never give that to the school system. You personally teach your children with as much love as you can muster, and you teach them these words. For we live in a, an interesting time, and children must hear the word of God. I want you to notice that Solomon doesn't start off with the usual my son format, but rather he says sons, it's plural. The King James Version reads, ye children, and others, all except for the contemporary English version, uses my sons, it's plural. Proverbs 4.1 is employing the same appeal as Psalm 34, verse 11, where it says, Hear ye, my children, the instruction of the Father. Solomon to Rehoboam, his son, begins this session, listen, with an attempt to get the attention of the younger generation, a task that is not always easy, amen? To get the attention of the younger generation. My goodness, how we compete with video games and music and movies. And now we have on demand. And now we have all these things where we can be, we, the, the adults, if you will, the parents can be tuned out at a moment's notice. But if you, you couple the, the technology and the, the, the busyness of life with the attempt to get the younger generation's attention, we also understand that in our culture today, Fathers are often absent the instruction of their children in today's culture. Fathers are out in the world. Fathers are at work. Fathers have abandoned their homes. Fathers have left their wives. Children are left without the father's instruction. Youth are willingly uh, uh, ignoring or rebelling against the older generation in this culture. And somehow we have been convinced by the world, which has no place in the church, by the way, but we've been convinced by the world that there is some kind of a separation between the younger generations and the older generations, and we call that a generation gap. Now, there's not a generation gap. There's an unwillingness to speak to one another and to listen to one another. All this has contributed to the lack of wisdom being shown to the younger from the older. The church must fill this gap, and this church must instruct, disciple one another as we have been taught by the word of God. Christian parents must then take this word that we teach and teach to their children. For when a generation does not learn the wisdom of God, the times that follow become bleak and full of evil. We have such witness of this many times in the Bible, but I just want to quickly read Joshua chapter 2. Starting in verse 10, I'm just going to read in part the full context. But it says, in all that generation, uh, all also were gathered their fathers. It starts out by saying, the generation, the old generation, the ones that had been there, they passed away. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done. And the people of Israel, this new generation, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served false gods. They abandoned the Lord. They went after other gods and things, and they bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord, and they could no longer withstand their enemies. And listen to what the Bible says, and they were in terrible distress. Anybody reading the papers today? Anybody understand that this younger generation that so much needs our love and so much needs our words, that they are in terrible distress? They worry about things we never worried about? They've been told that the world is going to end in 12 years due to the climate. They've been told that we hate each other. They've been told that we, we're not to do certain things. We're to, they've got all this list of things, and what they need is our love, older people. They need our love. They need our instruction. And so Solomon, knowing this history, 
He says again to his son, he says, listen, pay attention. I am giving you good instruction. I want you to, I want you to think about a question. How do you know when instruction is good or bad? More importantly, how do your children? Because children hear a lot of instruction, and it's not all equal. You and I hear a lot of instruction. We actually tell each other things, and we're, we're, we're given advice through, through letters and emails and social media. But it's not all equal. Some of it's bad, positioned as good. So how do we know when we can say, listen, pay attention, I'm giving you good instruction? How can I know as a pastor standing here before you today that accountable to God that I'm giving you good instruction this morning? How can we know? Hang in with these verses and you're going to see something amazing. First of all, I want you to see when you, you see this word son or sons, it can be singular, it can be plural, child or children. <clears throat> we are hearing the Hebrew word bane. We spell it B-A-N-E. It means, obviously, a son, but here's the catch. It's a son who is a builder to the family name. Now, I want you to remember that when we get into this text. I want you to remember that in your own condition. When you came into this world, your family gave you the family name. How are you building it? How are you building the future generations of your family name? Is it built on the world or is it built in Christ Jesus? It, it, are you contributing to the family name in a good and wise way, or are you contributing to the family name being brought down to the evil and to the destruction that is in this world? I remember my dad telling me, I was somewhere in middle school, and he said, son, I can't give you much, but I gave you my name, and I want you to take care of it. I remember him saying that to me, and he had that gnarly finger that he kept pointing at me. And he said, I want you to take care of my name. Why? Because his granddad gave him the, it, my granddad gave him the name, and dad had taken care of the name, and he wanted that to carry on. I'm not sure if we even recognize names as even important in our culture anymore today. But I can assure you before God, he knows our name. And he cares. And we need to pass that on to our children. Solomon here in chapter 4. By the way, that, that word bane for my sons, it also can be used in a wide sense of a son, a grandson, nation or subjects. So Solomon here in chapter 4 has as his audience, obviously his son Rehoboam, along with the other children that him and Solomon's wife had. And as king of the nation, Solomon has his pupils, the nation, to teach. The king of Israel was not only to instruct his own children, as Deuteronomy 6 taught, but the king had additional responsibilities that you can find in the Old Testament to teach the people God's word. So our application continues for us here in the sanctuary to be our children, to teach them, and we can see the awesome responsibility that we have in Christ and the blessing God gives us in the teachings of others as well. Now, I have a responsibility to teach my children. I have responsibility to make disciples. And, and so Jesus said, as, as he was ready to ascend into heaven, having fulfilled his father's work, he said, therefore, go and make disciples. I'm curious how well of a disciple maker we can be if we don't even care to disciple our own children. Sometimes uh, uh, we live in a culture where we're worried about what other people do, but we haven't checked our own backyard. You know what I'm saying? So we're nation builders of the family name, but we serve the greatest name in the world. His name is Jesus Christ. How are you name building the name Jesus Christ? Jesus said, go and make disciples. The Holy Spirit reminds us in 1 Peter that we who believe in Christ as Lord and Savior, it says we are a chosen race. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that the reason why God has made us this, that we might proclaim the praises of the one who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Why am I saved? To give him glory and praise. Or do we do this with our children? Do we do this with each other? God's marvelous light is Jesus Christ, the power and the wisdom of God. We are to instruct our children. And we are to instruct one another to obtain wisdom. Jesus as the first order, as we will see here in Scripture. 
supreme, wisdom supreme in all that we acquire or could acquire. We must first be discipled, church, and so learn. And this morning's passage in these first nine verses is how do we learn? We must first be discipled and learn, and then we impart what we have been given to our children and to others. It is important to remember that we can only give what we have first obtained. I can't give something I don't have. If I have not acquired Jesus, I cannot give Jesus. If I have not acquired God's wisdom, who is Christ, then I cannot give wisdom. So the first responsibility is with each one of us in the sanctuary to remember to obtain wisdom. We've already gone over this through the first three chapters of Proverbs. So we must acquire this teaching of Proverbs, and then like Solomon, we must teach well. Solomon says, listen. Listen to a father's discipline. That word discipline there obviously involves instruction. When I use the word discipline, most people go, ooh, that's the bad stuff. No, discipline is good. It's a teaching. It's an instruction. However, in the word, it also can be a warning. It also can be a reproof. That is a correction. And yes, discipline can be a chastisement, which is the one that we always go, ooh, with. That's teaching. That's in, that's a father's discipline. It's all those things. If a father only cares about spanking his child, he's missed the word of God. If a father only cares about giving his child everything so that they, they are blessed beyond degree and they get everything they want, the father has missed the word of God. It is to be equaled out into instruction, God's instruction that Solomon is giving here to his son. He says, listen. Then he adds to that, he says, pay attention so that you gain understanding. Um, we're going to talk about pay attention in just a moment, but the word understanding is basically knowledge, and the biblical word for, for knowledge really is a perfect understanding. So we have wisdom who is a person, and wisdom comes from God, and the wisdom is the ability to know the right and the wrong, and to what? Do the right. That can only be done in Christ Jesus. And then understanding is understanding why we serve, why we glorify God, why things are the way they are. And, and so he says, get wisdom, and that way you will have understanding. So the first question that comes with this verse is this. How do we learn? Solomon says, listen, and he says, pay attention. The word listen means hear intelligently. Now, i got to give you some grammar, so I want you to work with me here this morning. I know, I know school isn't for another month away, young people, but I want you to hang in there with me. I want you to go to class early this morning. Okay? Listen. Hear intelligently. It always has with it, when we listen, when we hear intelligently, it always has the quality of obedience that accompanies the listening. In other words, if I listen, but I don't obey what I heard, I've not heard what I listened to. Okay? It means nothing, basically. If, I, if you're listening to me this morning, and you have no intent, no purpose to apply God's word to your life, you might as well be out playing golf or somewhere else. You have not done anything for yourself or certainly for God to be here without the intention to obey what is being taught from the word of God. So he, he, he says... Listen and uh, uh, pay attention. The word listen, hearing attention, uh, intentionally, now pay attention, is your responsibility to attend to know. We use this expression, prick the ears. You ever got the TV on in the background, you hear something, all of a sudden you go, oh, what did that say? That's pricking the ears. Um, sometimes when you attend sermons, and uh, I've had my share of attending people talking and sermons, sometimes the pastor will say something, and you go off into a field of dreams thinking about what was said, and then a few minutes later, something pricks your ears, and you come back in tune. That's still listening with intent. What you did is you took the first thing that pricked your ears, and you, you worked it through your mind. And then God brought you back to the next thing, and now you're working that through your mind. It is impossible for you to hear every single word I'm saying. So Minister Gaines says, buy my CD and that'll take care of your problem. Just keep listening to it. <laughs> Just kidding. 
I think they'll give it to you. You don't have to buy it. But pay attention. Let God's word prick your ears. And, and so you ever hear the word hearken? Hearken to the word? It's pricking the ears. It's, it's, it's paying attention. It's marking well what has been said. Now, we can attend a sermon and we can attend class. Maybe uh, many of you were at Sunday school this morning. And so we can put off the check mark that we were at Sunday school. We were at church today. And I need you to know that that in itself is not listening. That's attendance. Having attended a sermon or a class, we can say later today maybe what the sermon or the class was about. We can give a highlight of it. We can, we can review. Maybe, maybe even give the title of the sermon to someone. Or, or I, I don't remember all that he said, but it was in Proverbs chapter 4. Maybe, maybe we can recall some things. That too is not listening. It's better than just attending, being, you know, out there in left field and not hearing a word, but it's still not learning. Here's what learning is. It's a demonstration that we have marked well, and so we have listened by applying the very things learned in our daily life. You can only listen when you take the information and directly apply it. And use it. Then you've listened. Everything else is just attendance. We apply obediently that which we learned as we travel along. Otherwise, we just simply attended but did not hear or mark well what was being said. Let me give you an example. I can attend the elementary class, and, and I did, and I didn't mark well the elementary class that, that teaches one plus one equals two. Math was never my subject and was scary when I took finance in college. But anyway, that's another story for another day. But one plus one equals two. How many of you would agree with that? All right. So you have obviously marked that well from years ago of being in school. So let's say someone attends that elementary class and they're taught that morning one plus one equals two, but the student goes back and gives the answer three over and over and over again. The student did not hear intelligently with obedience to the mathematical truth. He didn't get it. And so he may have attended, but he's not one ounce better for have attending. I have not understanding of which that which was taught if I don't apply it and use it in my life. I attended, but I did not mark well. You've heard me use the expression often, we have a lot of head knowledge in church today. Head knowledge is knowing what the answers are, but not applying it to our life. I remember back when I was teaching the youth group, and uh, uh, I, I could ask a question. They knew if they said God, Jesus, or the Holy Spirit, they got the answer right. They knew the answer, but sometimes they didn't have the understanding to work out what that answer meant. Wisdom is working out the answer in the right way before God. It's paying attention. So Solomon wanted his sons to hear with obedience, and now he gives a reason. So the next question, the first one is how do we learn? The next one is why learn? Why spend time this morning looking at this scripture? Look at verse 2. It's a causal verse. You guys know what a causal means. Something is said, there's a reaction that will take place. Solomon says four. That's the causal word. He says, I'm giving you good instruction. Now, that's a pretty bold statement. When a teacher, teacher stands up and says, I'm going to teach you something today that's the most important thing you'll ever hear in your life, that's a pretty important statement that needs to bear, needs to have weight. We need to see if that's true. Is what you're hearing this morning good instruction? Is the child in the home hearing their parents speak and act before them? Is that good instruction? Solomon says, I, I'm giving you good instruction. He says, don't abandon my teaching. The word teaching, I want you to circle there, it's, it's the word for Decalogue or Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is the first five books of the Old Testament. When he says teaching, he says, here's what he's saying. I'm giving you God's word. What makes good teaching? God's point of view, not mankind's. Church, I need to say that again because most of church is caught up in man's teachings, man's wisdoms, man's philosophies, man's politics. And when I say man's, I mean mankind, male and female created by God. And that doesn't belong in the house of God. 
The Bible says clearly that in Jesus Christ, we have been made into one new person. There is neither rich nor poor, male nor female. We are one new person in Christ. And so when he says this is good instruction, he's saying it's good instruction based on the word of God. The same word used for the Pentateuch, which was God's word in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, number, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He says, I'm giving you. That, he says, I'm adding, I'm applying, I'm appointing a good instruction, a good word to you. He, he, the instruction, the word instruction there, I'm giving you good instruction. Again, in the Hebrew language, there's an implication. The student is being taught. So in this case, in this context, in the sanctuary this, this morning, I'm, quote, the teacher, you're, quote, the student. The only way I could have taught this morning is if I had prepared this week, amen? The only way you can receive is to pay attention. When you go home, you were to have marked well, paid attention well enough to what? Teach in your family and others. That's the way God has designed his family in Christ Jesus. Sometimes I'm the teacher, sometimes I'm the student. But good instruction has to have a properly something received, both on the teacher's side to instruct and the student's side to receive. And you can, you can weigh this out throughout Scripture. Now, look at verses 3 through 9. It's going to relate the good instruction and the command to not abandon Solomon's teaching. He says, listen and don't abandon, he says. It, it comes from a source learned. He, Solomon was confident what he was teaching was from uh, an eternal perspective, a God perspective, a, a good word. So he says in verse 3, When I was a son with my father, tender and precious to my mother, he taught me. Now I want to show you something in this. I want you to, to write down somewhere so you don't miss this point, is that Solomon was literally relaying to his son a time when he, Solomon, was a tender young age too. Did you know most children can't fathom that their dad or mom was a child of a parent at one time? Did you know that? Solomon is taking an incredible teaching moment and saying, look, son, I was like you back here. And I was with my father, and, and I was tender and precious to my mother. What he was saying is, I was like you. I didn't know squat, and I had to be taught. Kids think their parents are like brilliant. It's wonderful. It's the only people in the world who think you're brilliant. They're, it's great. And then they grow up. But anyway, Solomon was, was taking his, his child back. And he says, when I was a son with my father. So there's a literal teaching here. There's, there, he was showing when King David was his father and Bathsheba was his mother. David spoke to Solomon the wisdom of God he had, he had obtained. Uh, the Bible says that David was a friend uh, to God. But we know David's life had some pitfalls, amen? And then Solomon, he had a wife, and then Rehoboam came along. And, and through the, the word of God, through life experience, through the things that God had brought them through, they were teaching their children. There's, this is a literal illustration. Think back, uh, if you're older and your, your children have left home, think back about how you taught them and how sometimes you had to share an experience that may have been uncomfortable where you failed and you had to teach your son or daughter that, hey, don't go down this road. Think about the times where you couldn't share with them what you did, but you had to say, trust me, you don't want to go there. This is what Solomon is doing when I was, when I was a son with my father. But there's something powerful. There's the, the literal illustration, but I want you to see the spiritual truth tucked in Scripture. Don't miss this point. Go back and reread that. When I was a son with my father, who are you seeing? Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus. He says, when I was. Did you know that's the same Hebrew word uh, expression, haya, which is when God said to Moses, I am sent you. You remember that? Moses said to God, well, when, if you send me to the Pharaoh and the people ask who, who, by what authority you send me? God said, I am sent you. So that same expression, I am with my father. 
This is Jesus. I want you to catch this because um, in Psalm 2, we read that I will declare the Lord's decree. We, we read, excuse me, I will declare the Lord's decree. He said to me, God said to Jesus, God said to his Messiah, God said to his Christ, the me is Christ speaking, and the Lord is Jehovah, I am self-existent God. He said, he said to me, you are my son, today I have become your father. This is what verse 3 has shown us, when I was a son. Have you ever pictured Jesus growing up? Now we know that, that Joseph was the earthly uh, protector over the family. But who was Jesus' father? I hope you say God. Conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin, born in the town of Bethlehem, we have the record. I know there's people that don't believe it. That's their problem. That's their hell, not mine. I believe what God says. And I will stand on what God has said. And someone wants to dispute it or argue about it, they can go out there in the world and argue and dispute it. In here, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born unto the Virgin Mary. And so we have this, and, and Jesus comes into the world. Now, here's, here's the tricky part. Here's, here's theology, the study of God. When we say that Jesus is the flesh of God, what we're saying is that Jesus is fully God, and he is fully man. Now, we can identify with the man side. <laughs> we don't identify with the God side. But when you were born in this world, can anybody raise their hand and say you were born into this world completely intelligent with all knowledge and you knew how to get along in life? We couldn't even feed ourselves. We couldn't even clean ourselves. Amen? So when we were an infant, think of baby Jesus. He came the same as me and you. Yes, he was fully God, but he had submitted himself from the throne of God to come down so that he might save us from our sin. So he became like man, which means he had to grow like man. Now, who was his father instructing him? God. And so we see the example of Christ when he was conceived, when he was born in flesh. He was tender and he needed to grow from infant to child and from child to teen and teen into adulthood. And as he grew, Jesus learning and applying, Jesus was precious to his mother. You remember that verse in Luke where he says, Mary treasured, pondered in her heart all these things? He was precious. Can you imagine Mary getting to hold the Son of God in her arms? Could you imagine Joseph, who was no more than a guardian, who got to hold the Son of God in his arms? And they got the privilege and the blessing to teach this child? Every parent in here has a blessing from God who is a child of God. We have that blessing. That child is from heaven, from God. He had to learn like we do. Jesus, fully God, yet fully man, learned from birth. Hebrews 5.8 says, though he were a son, listen, he's talking about Jesus. Though Jesus were a son, yet learned Jesus, learned he obedience by the things he what? Suffered. Now, what is obedience, church? You say the word, starts with an F, ends with a G. Suffering. But I don't want to suffer. You're in the wrong universe at the wrong time. And since Adam and Eve took of the fruits instead of taking of God, you and I will suffer. We're broken in that suffering. We disobeyed God. We broke his perfect creation. And so God in flesh came to restore all things unto himself. Jesus suffered we will suffer to obey God's word. Let me give you a couple quick illustrations, and we're going to go through the rest of the verses, in chat, or rest of the nine verses here. If I say to you, thou shalt not lie, would everybody agree that's one of the ten? Thou shalt not lie. All right. You may not like that command, but we all agree it's a command, right? Thou shalt not lie. Now, most of us will say, yeah, that's obvious. We shouldn't lie. It's not good to lie. Until there's a danger that we might be ratted out, exposed, or found wrong. So we might begin to justify, reason within our heart, well, if I taint the, not the lie, but the truth, if I just, if I just deviate a little bit and shade it and call it a, a white lie, 
then I'll be okay. Because I don't want them to know I did exactly this, but it's okay to let them know I may have done this. What have we done at that point? We've gratified ourselves instead of suffered to be obedient to God's word. Do you know why people don't come to Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior? They don't want to suffer faith to believe in him. They'd rather go their own way. They'd rather be comfortable in their own skin. They'd rather be comfortable in living life the way they see it, the way their path has been chosen. It's not about whether God is true or false. Man doesn't determine that. God has said it. He is true. It's not about whether God created or we evolved. God has already declared in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Since none of us, a mankind, was there, mankind wouldn't know. So it's not about these issues that people want to argue about. Salvation is rejected by people because they don't want to trust God with their life. They don't want to suffer the things of holiness to God. But when we turn our life over to God and we suffer in his obedience, we find the blessing of God that passes all understanding of peace and joy and, yes, prosperity, all those things in the Bible because God's presence lives with us in the Holy Spirit. We're scared of it before, but when we experience it, it's a blessing. That's acquiring wisdom, acquiring Christ to walk with Christ, the person of wisdom. Let me move quickly here. I want you to look at verse 6. Um, I, I'm sorry. I, I want to say one more thing about Jesus. I want to just say one more thing about the obedience. I, I want you to see in verse 3 that when I was a son with my father, we can see Jesus too spiritually. Um, we, we've already said that Jesus had to learn through suffering God's way, not man's. Jesus, I need you to know that Jesus was tempted in all fashions. There, there's a false theology out there that says because Jesus was God and fully man, he would have never sinned. No, Jesus had to choose the right path like you and I do. He was fully man. Yes, he was fully God, but he had to learn obedience through suffering. He was tempted in all areas, just like you and I were tempted. And, and so uh, he learned this obedience, and he is the wisdom and power of God because Philippians 2 tells us something. Look, look at Philippians chapter 2 and starting in verse 6. It says, who, talking about Jesus, existing in the form of God, Jesus existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited, used to his advantage, to put himself above somebody else or to put himself above God. Instead, he what? Emptied himself. You want to know what a Christian is? One who empties themselves to Christ Jesus. Why? Because Christ Jesus emptied himself to God, the Father. Emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant. No, 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 I want to be a CEO. No, 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 I want to be the boss. No, 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 I want my rights, and that person can't take my rights away. Well, as a servant of Jesus Christ, I have no rights except that which Jesus Christ gave me. As a servant of Jesus Christ, that's the, the nicer term for slave, to be honest with you. If you look at it, it's a dalos in Greek language, a slave, an under rower, somebody who has no power or authority other than which the master will give them, the master to the slave. Now, I'm either a servant of sin or I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. I choose Jesus Christ. Do you choose Jesus Christ this morning? So as we, as we look at this, we, we, we see he some humbled himself to the form of servant. He says, taking on the likeness of humanity, and when he had come as a man, he what? Humbled himself. What's another reason man doesn't obtain salvation? He won't humble himself before God. He tells God, I got it. I got all the information I need. I got the right way of life. My way is fine. And so they, they won't humble themselves by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross as Jesus did. And then verse 9 says, For this reason God, God highly exalted him. So, Jesus learned the Father's word, and Jesus spoke all that the Father gave him to say. say. When tempted, Jesus chose the right path. Uh, I want you to listen to this, because this is going to be the next Proverbs verse we encounter. When tempted, Jesus said something. Satan came to him, 
and gave him what we thought would be an easy temptation. Sometimes uh, when I was a teenager, I used to think, well, I wish I used to get, get those softballs because I'm getting much greater temptation than that. No, actually, that's not true when you really read the Bible. But Satan tipped at Jesus, and Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from what? The mouth of God. How are we doing, church? See, we, we think sometimes church life is Sunday, and then Monday through Saturday we can live moral, moral relativity any way that we want. No. Every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. My home life, my work life, my leisure life, all of my life, all 24 hours a day, seven days a week, must be bathed in every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. That's the wisdom that Solomon is teaching his son to acquire. So, go back to Proverbs 4.4. 4. Um, after he acknowledges that when I was a son with my father, he says, he taught me and he said, your heart must hold on to my words. Keep my commands and live. Hold on to my words. If you listen, pay attention. If you pay attention, don't let go. If you pay attention, apply these words to your life. Jesus said, every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, your heart must hold on to my words, the word of God, and what? Live. So if I refuse the words of God, I don't live. If I refuse the word of God, who is Jesus Christ, I do not live. But if I hold on to the word of God, who is the wisdom of God, who is the Christ of God, who is Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for my sins, then I shall live. And we have the proof that Jesus is alive. So he says, keep them. Hold on to my words. So David taught Solomon in this regard. Solomon taught Rehoboam in this regard. And Jesus gave us the example in his life. I want to do a summary of the verses that need to be applied. Look, starting at verse 5 in Proverbs 4. He says, get wisdom, get understanding. The word get is a purchase type word. You can't purchase the love of God. God was, was pleased with you to die for your sins. However, you got some stuff that you need to sell, get rid of. It's the stuff of yourself that prevents you from a close, intimate relationship with God. It's three letters. Starts with an S, ends with an N, and you got to get rid of it. It's called sin. You need to let it go. You need to lay it at the cross, the foot of Jesus. Because he is the only one who can forgive your sins. And he is the only one who removes your sins as far as the east is from the west. So get wisdom. Wisdom is Christ. Get understanding. He says, don't forget or turn away from the words from my mouth. Hmm, wisdom's mouth? Yes, because who's the mouth of wisdom? Christ Jesus. What was Christ's word? Love one another. Love your neighbor and love even your enemies. Jesus said, believe on me. And Jesus said, love. What must the church do? Believe in Christ Jesus and love. How do we obtain wisdom then? Believe in Jesus and love. Love God, love mankind, love one another, even to the point of loving your enemies. And there's no negotiating room in that. That's the wisdom from God. So he says, get wisdom, get understanding. Verse 6, he says, don't abandon wisdom. That is, don't turn your back on wisdom. Who's wisdom? Christ. Don't turn your back on Christ Jesus. And Solomon personifies wisdom as a woman because he lived before the age of Christ. He said, she will watch over you. Didn't Jesus say, I will never leave you nor forsake you? Say amen. Who else could say that? The wisdom of God. Who is the wisdom of God? Jesus Christ, who is from God. So she'll watch over you. Love her and she will what? Guard you. I'm often uh, amazed at myself on that one. If God stepped down from heaven to save my awful flesh from sin, to give me new life in Christ Jesus, why would I think if I'm following and obeying his will that I would go out here and fall into harm or to stumble? Doesn't even make sense, does it? But if I cherish, if I love my Savior, he will guard me. 
Look at verse 7. Wisdom is supreme, so get wisdom. That looks pretty in our language. But in the Hebrew language, there's no verb there, is. So basically what it says in the Hebrew language, acquire wisdom, get wisdom. You have to have wisdom before you can have wisdom, is what the Hebrew language is saying. So how do you get wisdom before you have wisdom, and how do you have wisdom before you get wisdom? Answer, Christ Jesus. I come to Christ Jesus, a sinner, lost, full of sin. And I say, Lord Jesus Christ, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins, and that your blood has forgiven me of my sin. And because of your work, Lord God, I know that I am forgiven and redeemed. I've just acquired wisdom. Now, as I walk with my Savior, he gives me wisdom to act and to move. And Minister Gaines read that in James, what that looks like. But you have to get wisdom, Jesus Christ, to have wisdom, the life of wisdom. He says, whatever else you get, get understanding. Wisdom is first, understanding is two, and then whatever else follows from there. Verse 8, cherish her and she will exalt you. God has said over and over, both in the Old and New Testament, in many as various ways, here's the truth. If you exalt yourself, God will humble you. But if you humble yourself, what did Christ do? He humbled himself. What will God do? Exalt you. Mankind's sin is we always want to exalt ourselves. Amen? Amen. You might as well say it. I already know it. Man sin, because I got the big disease too. We always want to elevate ourselves. We always, we have the right answers. We have all the answers. My way or the highway. It's my viewpoint that wins. All those things. That's mankind. But before God, we are nothing but a breath that is fleeting. But in Christ, we are his and we are precious to him. Cherish her and she will exalt you. If you embrace her, if you embrace Christ, Christ will what? Honor you. And embrace is just another way of saying hold on to his word, his precious word. And then finally, the, the crown, the, the victory, the hope. Wisdom will place a garland of favor on your head and will give you a crown of beauty. Let me close by saying something I said earlier this morning in the message. We can either attend this church and attend this sermon and we can even attend the word of God at times by opening it up and reading a few verses or we can learn and grow the choice the balance the responsibility rests on each one of us when we raise our children we give them the best that we have and what do the children ultimately have to do choose God gave us the best he absolutely had he gave us himself Christ Jesus on the cross God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life that's on you each one of us I can preach it until in Oklahoma the cows come home but only you can say, I believe. If you have not wisdom, if you have not Christ in your life, that's the first responsibility to respond to this morning. But church, let me talk to you too. Sometimes we travel thinking that it's wisdom, but it's really our own thoughts and deeds. You've seen a lot of things in Proverbs up to chapter 4, verse 9 so far. The, the listening, the learning, the paying attention, the marking well, the heeding, is by taking those areas of our life that are not balanced rightly in Christ and saying, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry. He is just and faithful to forgive us. And then going His, his way. Verse 10 forward is going to show the path. And there's two. One path will lead you to God the Father. The other path will lead you to hell. All of mankind, I've been on that road, is on the path to hell. Only in Christ Jesus are we taken off the path to hell and put on the road, the path to God. 
But even on that path, we can veer to the left or to the right. So as church members, as Christians, as believers in Christ Jesus, we have a responsibility not to just attend, but to apply the Word of God in our lives. There's no such thing as one and done. I got wisdom. It's all all right. Mark that off my list. It's a lifelong journey in Christ. Solomon was continually teaching his son. God the Father, His Holy Spirit has continually taught me, and He'll teach me until the day that I go home. It's the same for you. Let's not take that grace so flimsily. Let's not take that grace so cheap. Let's rejoice that God, while we were yet sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. Let's embrace that. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you would work on our hearts as we close this message out. Lord, with decision time. Lord, your word says that you died while we were yet sinners. You are the wisdom of God. You are the very personification that we've been reading about in Proverbs. And you have said to us, get wisdom. Wisdom is supreme. So I pray, Lord, that if there is one in here walking without your wisdom, without your perfect salvation thrust upon us, the Holy Spirit, you would minister to their hearts even at this moment. Lord, maybe many of us came for a fresh word to be revived in our spirit toward you. As a psalmist cried out, return to me the joy of your salvation. Maybe that was some of us that were here this morning. And Lord, maybe in those circumstances, we veered to the left or to the right, that we've not fixed our eyes on you. And so I ask, Lord, Holy Spirit, that you administer to our hearts so that we would confess those things that block us from you. That we would confess those things that cause us to turn our back or to abandon you. And that we would return in the fullness of your grace. Lord, maybe someone just needs a prayer or a renewed hope. You know our hearts, Lord. You know our needs. And so I pray that at this moment, you would minister to each one of us and that we would respond to what you place on our heart. If it's to get up and receive salvation, Lord, move us to get up and receive. If it's to get up and be strengthened in your love, then Lord, allow us to get up and be strengthened in your love. Whatever your message, enable us, Lord, to respond, I pray in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Would you?